Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Guðrún Pétursdóttir. I'm the director of the Institute for Sustainability Studies, Stopnin Sæmunda Fróða. And it's indeed a great pleasure and honor to welcome Dr. Dennis Meadows as invited speaker to the University of Iceland. Dr. Meadows is world known as one of the authors of the groundbreaking report, Limits to Growth, which was prepared for the Club of Rome in 1972. The report explores the relations between ever increasing world population and the finite natural resources of the earth. At the time, the alarming results demanded immediate action to avoid a catastrophic collapse. The report got a tremendous reception. Millions of copies sold all over the world. But I guess the model was so scary that it was bound to evoke fierce reactions. Now, 40 years later, revisiting the models shows that they hold, unfortunately, which they didn't, we should have reacted back then. Our great enemy seems to be the insurmountable barrier between what we humans know and what we do. I look forward to hearing your take on the current situation and the prospects we face. Dr. Meadows, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. This is my second visit to Iceland. I was here 59 years ago. I said that to a number of my Iceland friends and they said, oh, I wasn't here 59 years ago. <laughs> and those two visits, now that I think about it, actually were very important. Uh, milestones in my career because in 1959 when I passed through Iceland I was just finishing my high school and about to start my professional studies which led then into the project for the Club of Rome and that led to a 40-year career doing research consulting and speaking about these issues related to physical growth. Now it's 59 years later and I'm just at the end of my professional career. Still talking about <laughs> the problems we face with uh, physical growth. And I'm going to reflect with you today a little bit uh, about this. This will be quite a personal speech. I'm sharing with you some ideas which are personally interesting to me and which are the focus of my current thinking and my current research. So in some cases I will give you questions but I don't give you any answers. When I was here the first time I was very optimistic. I was, knew I was going to become a scientist and I was very excited about that because science any kind of intellectual activity, I don't mean only physical sciences, but in the social sciences, philosophy and so forth. Science is a unique uh, profession because the things which you acquire that are most valuable, your ideas, you can give away to other people and still have them for yourself. If you work in business or you work in any of the physical uh, fields, those things which you acquire, if you give them away to others, then you don't have them anymore for yourself. So I was very excited about that. It's still true that giving away ideas is possible, but I'm not so optimistic anymore. I mean, I don't know most of you in this room, but typically the people who come to my speeches aren't skeptics about growth. They aren't skeptical about climate change. They, uh, they already generally accept these uh, notions. And anyone who accepts them and who looks at the world around has to become sometimes a little pessimistic because it isn't working. 
You know, we have been uh, dealing one way or another with climate change for 40 years. Actually, our first book in 1972 had the uh, empirical data curve of rising CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. And still today, 40 years later, the CO2 is going up. In fact, faster and faster. Uh, and the fish are being overcaught in the seas, and the agricultural soils are being depleted, and so forth. I mean, so it's quite easy to become pessimistic. And so then comes the question, well, what do you do about that? I mean, you can deny the reality. You can uh, give it up and go do something else totally different. Uh, or what? Uh, and so this is uh, what I s struggle with. And I'm going to be sharing with you today uh, some ideas which I call strategies for personal and organizational success in a world that has limits to growth. What can you do for yourself, your family, what can you do for your organization to remain constructively and intelligently involved in this world, even seeing there are enormous problems? In uh, 1972, after I, or 1970, after I finished my uh, studies at MIT and became a professor, I had the opportunity to take on a project for the Club of Rome. I put together a group of 16 scientists and we worked together for about two years. We created a global computer model to help us understand the long-term causes and the long-term consequences of physical growth, uh, growth in population, growth in industry, growth in food production, growth in the use of minerals, and so forth, the, the physical attributes uh, of our society. And we came up with uh, three main conclusions. First, that the policies being pursued at that time were producing growth. That was not a very profound idea, you could look around and see the benefits of it. Uh, secondly, we concluded from our work that this growth could continue for a while longer, another 40 or 50 years maybe, uh, but if we didn't change our policies, the policies which were producing growth and producing benefits back in the 70s would start to produce serious negative problems for the society. So we were advocating to do quick ch policy change. And uh, we said that if we didn't make those changes, then in that period 2010 to 2040 or 50, depending on your assumptions, you would start to see really serious changes in the progress of our society. In other words, we said it's necessary to change habits. And actually that's going to be kind of a central focus of my uh, conversation with you today. And in order to put you into the right perspective, I'm going to give you a chance to practice. So put down all your papers and pencils. Everyone cross your arms. and look down to see which wrist is on top. And remember, drop your arms. Great, okay. Now, please cross your arms. And look down and see which wrist is on top. Okay, fine. Now, since I'm a scientist, I'm going to do an empirical research study. Everyone who had the same wrist up both times, raise your hand. <laughs> Almost everybody. And since this is a very intelligent group of people, it must mean there's some optimum technique here. So let's see which is it. Everyone who had the left wrist up both times, raise your hand. Everyone who had the right wrist up both times, raise your hand. Ah, see, this is quite interesting, roughly half and half. 
So although each of us does it the same way time after time, half are doing it one way and half are doing it the other way. And this is actually desirable and it's exactly what you expect. Crossing your arms is a habit. A habit is a way to solve a problem which comes up frequently. Frequently, you have to do something that doesn't require your arms. And then it would be really stupid if you had to spend 10 minutes figuring out what I should do now with my arms in order to get rid of them so I can solve the problem. So you develop a habit, you cross your arms, it gets them out of the way, and then you can get on with your job. And we, most habits work very well. But sometimes the conditions change. And then you need to have a new habit. So I ask you, cross your arms the other way. <laughs> so this little exercise shows three extremely important things which I, you must keep in mind during the rest of my conversation. Number one, it is possible to change your habits. You, you did, most of you, manage to do it the other way. Two, it's not easy. Uh, probably even you must make mistakes at first until you get it right. You have to think about it. And three, it's not comfortable at first. For the lefties, Doing it righty is, doesn't feel quite so good at first, but of course after a while it would be okay. Now our society faces the same situation. We have to change our habits, our habits related to the use of resources, our habits related to our expectations about the future, our habits in relationship to our political leaders, and so forth. We can do it. But we're going to have to think about it, and it's not going to be easy, and we certainly will make mistakes. And it's not going to be comfortable at first. When we do manage to do it, some of us, maybe all of us, will be quite uncomfortable. So it means, A, to be optimistic, but B, to realize we shouldn't just sit here waiting until we find some solution which is free of mistakes and makes everybody happy. Because if we wait until we have those habits, we never do anything. Okay, supposing we are willing to get ahead, what do we do? Here are the main ideas of my uh, talk. <clears throat> so, in 1972, when we published our first book, we, we actually generated 13 different computer scenarios from 1900 until 2100 because of course it's impossible to predict the future but you can imagine different realistic possibilities. We identified 13. Some we would call overshoot and some more loosely sustainable development. And in 1972 it seemed to us that both of those were possible. But sustainable development was going to require changing habits. We wouldn't get it automatically by doing what we were doing at that time. And unfortunately, as I will show you, our efforts to adapt our habits so far have failed. So we're still on the overshoot path. And that means now, I think, that we have to change somewhat our focus. In the 70s, it was useful and appropriate to talk about sustainable development. Now we need to talk about it in a different way. And once we start to do that, we need to make sure that we actually take action and don't just sit around in lecture halls talking about it. So here were the two paths that we showed in 1970, two of the 13 scenarios. This we might loosely term overshoot and collapse from 1900 until 2100, so it's same thing, 1900 till 2100. And there, that line and that line, those are where we were in 1972. So of course, both scenarios are the same, 
coming up until 1972. That's history. We knew what the history was. Looking forward, you could see that if you didn't change your policies, there would be still another 40 years of growth. But then, the decline would come. Whereas, if in 1972 we changed our policies, slowly you could produce a more attractive future. So, of course, we weren't the only one with these ideas. And, for example, the Brundtland Commission popularized the definition of sustainable development, which was very influential in the 80s and the early 90s. In that book, that report to the United Nations, was the statement, sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present, us, without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, this is just a wonderful definition for the politicians because it means essentially that they don't have to make any trade-offs. They can give you everything you want and then plus in the future everybody can have everything they want. This was an absolutely wonderful definition. And I think in the 80s, probably a useful starting point for discussion. But now we understand there's actually not even a chance that we're going to get what we want. And I even don't want to think about the future that we're giving to our kids. We need to change this definition, especially since if you see the, we, the way that people use this term, they bring to it some other ideas or some other meanings. Here are some common assumptions about sustainable development that seem to be implicit in what our leaders say. The rich will get to keep what they have and hopefully maybe even get a little bit more. Whenever you hear somebody talking about sustainable development, they, they aren't telling you that you need to have less. Of course, it's not fair that some people have a lot and other people have little. So sustainable development certainly means that the poor standards will rise up to the rich. That's another implicit assumption. How to do this? Well, no problem. We can do it without changing our habits, simply within the current system of markets and politics, just some carbon tax or some changing maybe slightly the ratio between renewable energy and fossil energy or increasing a little bit our percentage in foreign aid, this, this is going to give us a sustainable development inside the current system. And a key thing here is new technologies which decouple, which somehow magically reduce the amount of energy and materials required even while gross domestic product is going up. So these are the uh, ideas implicit in sustainable development and I tell you they're just a fantasy. They're virtually, they're politically attractive uh, for anyone who doesn't have to be around long enough to see the consequences of the stupid policies that they undertake if they're acting on this basis. Uh, but for people who expect to be around for a long time, like uh, you and me, uh, th this is just a fantasy. It's, uh, and so we need to, to rethink. The way we could have done this is what we call adaptation. It's a, adaptation is a process by which you see problems, develop new policies, and solve the problem. I'm a system dynamicist, we are like to use, like all disciplines, we like to use these arcane symbols and th this is the way we draw the adaptive loop. Don't get preoccupied about the uh, arrows and the uh, signs, I explain it, it's easy to understand verbally. Incidentally, if any of these slides are interesting to you, uh, I give them to you. I, so I will leave a copy here. So, uh, so that you can get them. So don't spend any of your time writing down these pictures. You can just get them afterwards. The meaning of this diagram is the following. There's a problem and it has an influence on the health of the system. Health could be, it depends on what the system is. It could be how much do you weigh? How big is your bank account? How large is your national debt? Uh, what percent are you uh, 
self-sufficient in food production. It's whatever indicator you used that indicates the health of the system. There's some problem. That negative sign means that if the problem gets bigger, the health gets smaller. And the arrow means causality, influence. So if the actual system changes, then after a while the perceived health also will change. Hopefully in the same direction. If the actual health goes down, after a while people start to perceive things are worse. And conversely. A problem, by definition, is the difference between what you perceive to have and what you want to have. There's a difference between perception and desired. And in an adaptive process, that difference stimulates some kind of action. Political or technical or action, it doesn't make a difference, it depends on the system. And hopefully, in an adaptive system, the action has a result which reduces the problem. So this is what we call a negative or adaptive or homeostatic feedback loop. And all of us, every day, depend on literally millions of these. Some consciously, and some automatically inside our body. Our body has thousands and thousands of these adaptive loops uh, you know, working. If it, the problem is that the room temperature goes up, then your body heat starts to go up, and as soon as that's perceived internally, you start to perspire, and that goes, that's an adaptive, which so takes you back down. This is great. The problem is that we evolved, humans evolved, to adapt under conditions where you get relatively quick, favorable responses to your action. You do something and then you wait and if something good happens, you say, oh, that's a good thing to do. And you adapt. Unfortunately, now, many of the problems that we face don't give quick feedback. There are delays at every link. I put in some delays here. Uh, take uh, climate change as an example, uh, just to illustrate concretely. So the actual health of the system is the amount of heat stored in the atmosphere. Uh, it takes a while to perceive what that really is. Even today there is still debate about whether the climate is changing or not. Uh, and then, of course, there's always an argument. What do you really desire? I spoke recently about climate change in Russia, and their attitude is, Fabulous. We are eager for things to warm up here. Let me, very simplistic understanding, but that's what they think. Uh, and then when there is a difference, you get into an argument. What should we do? Now we have uh, some people want to impose carbon tax. Other people want to put iron filings into the ocean. You know, so there's a debate. And then even when we start to do something, it can take, in the case of climate, centuries between the action and the response. So now we have an adaptive loop where the feedback doesn't come to us, it comes to our children or our grandchildren. And when we are in a situation like that, the tendency is to change the adaptive process into something else. And that's what we've really done. One way is to make it into what I call an addictive loop. We add a so we, we find some kind of action, the result of which is to make things look better. But they actually make the problem worse. Notice I crossed out the negative and put in a positive. So now, this is actually a positive loop, and this is the negative loop here. Uh, this is like uh, when you put pesticides onto an orchard. Over the short term, putting pesticides onto an orchard makes it seem healthier because you kill the bugs but you actually destroy the natural processes of the ecosystem so that over the longer term, the orchard has more problems from bugs. Uh, or uh, take the use of antibiotics, a big problem in the United States. Now we're giving antibiotics to people. Over the short term, they feel better, but the result is, of course, the bugs are evolving, and a decade or two from now, the health of people will actually be much worse. So, and this isn't only biological, it can also be uh, in such things like uh, physical. For example, in the United States, now we are addicted to debt. Debt causes problems, and we try to solve those problems by creating 
more debt. And we're now in a process where uh, both the domestic and the public private debts are all growing. And it's not only here, it's in Japan, it's in uh, many other countries. We have become addicted because over the short term, doing it makes things seem better. There's another way that we can change the adaptive process so that it doesn't work very well. That I call acceptance. I told you that a problem is a difference between what you have and what you want. There's two ways to solve the problem. You can get more or want less. Sometimes wanting less is a very constructive feature. Uh, if, for example, the goal is to accumulate money. But in other cases, wanting less is very negative. Uh, if, for example, you are willing to accept uh, higher levels of poverty or greater levels of gun ownership or you know, any, any of these uh, ideas. And so now, the way this adaptive loop has changed is that this becomes important. Instead of uh, taking a difference to eliminate, you just simply say, well, I actually didn't want so much. You know, this is uh, like your body weight. You know, you have a, a desired body weight for yourself. And then suddenly you notice your body weight is starting to go up. Now you can do two things. You can diet or you can say, well, actually it's okay to be a little fat. So you slip your goals. Uh, and that's just what we're doing uh, globally. Uh, you see it, uh, for example, with population. In the 70s, there was actually enormous concern globally about population. There were big national, international conferences on how to stabilize the population. Korea was successful in stabilizing its population. Everybody thought that was a fabulous success. Now we don't think about that anymore. We just accept it. And you see, in 1972, the population was here. We said in our report, it's extremely important to stabilize it. You see what an incredibly big impact we had uh, on the public debate. Uh, now in 2000, it's already six. Today, it's over seven. Recently, the United Nations revised its estimates and thinks now it's going to go up to nine, maybe. We are accepting something which we should be working very much against. And the result of that, as was mentioned by the person who introduced me, is that we are moving into a, a period of serious problem. Recently in Australia, the National Research Institute, CSIRO, the Commonwealth Scientific Industrial Research Institute, uh, scientists did a study. They took our uh, 1972 forecasts and compared them with recent data on the real state of the world. In our 1972 forecasts, uh, for, and they took two of our scenarios, the overshoot and the sustainable development. So here you see that's the overshoot and that's the sustainable overshoot sustainable, etc. The blue is the sustainable and the green is the overshoot from our 1972 computer. And then they gathered historical data on global reality year by year from about 1950, well up to roughly 2000, and they put those dots on the graph. And you can see that in most cases, the historical data are following right along on our overshoot uh, path, which you would expect because we didn't change our policies. And now the troubles are going to start coming. Uh, and we see it in many ways. In Take oil production. This is conventional cheap oil. This isn't shale oil or deep oil. This is the stuff which is most important. It's the stuff that uh, we pumped out in the United States, Saudi Arabia, and so forth. The green shows the amount of oil that's discovered in each year. The black line shows the amount that's actually used in each year. In the early years, back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, we were discovering huge oil fields and we weren't using very much oil. So everything above the black line basically stayed in the ground like a bank deposit. In 1984, for the first time, 
We used more oil than we discovered. And every single year since then, we've used more oil than we've discovered. So now we're in this red deficit area. This is what we could imagine for the discoveries. And it's just a question, when does this peak out? And uh, the consensus is it peaked out in 2006, and now it's starting to go back down. There's some minor offset from shale oil, from uh, tar sands, and so forth. But they are very expensive, enormously damaging to the environment, and never will be able to replace what we got from conventional oil. So now we're moving into a period of gap, and we can expect more and more difficulties from that. And you can see it in other ways. Here's um, empirical data from an institute in Belgium on natural, so-called natural disasters from 1900 up until 2010. And the red bar shows how many natural disasters. And by this, they mean earthquakes and tsunamis and so forth and so on. And you see we're in a period of rapidly rising. Partly, I'm sure, this goes up because we have better reporting mechanisms. We know more about the natural disasters that occur in remote areas. But it's also happening because we're stressing the system more, have a higher population density, and so forth. What to do? Well, I uh, asked myself that question. The thing is, we cause these problems. You know, they're not being forced on us by some mysterious alien power. If we did it to ourselves, it seems to me we should be able to undo it to ourselves. But doing that is going to require that we really understand what's going on. We have to understand the underlying reality. And so now I'm going to give you another chance to practice. I have invented a secret code. I'm going to use this code to show you numbers. And I'll make it very simple. I'll stick with five different numbers. One, two, three, four, five. I'll represent a number and then see if you can guess. Of course, the first time you won't guess correctly, most of you, but hopefully you'll learn quickly the code and then you'll have a new way of understanding how to represent numbers. Okay. What number am I showing you? Everybody, for, don't wait until somebody else says the answer. I want each of you to think, really, what number am I showing you? Okay, don't, don't speak, just think. I'm showing you four. Who thought I was showing you four? Raise your hand. Roughly one-fifth of the people. Good, statistically what you would expect. So let's try it again. What number am I showing you? I'm showing you one. Now I'm showing you three. Now I'm showing you four. The code is very simple. But not if you look inside the box. Leaders, you know, we have in English a saying, I don't care who votes as long as I get to pick the candidates. And the economists don't care which of their policies we use as long as we keep ourselves inside the box. This is where you find carbon tariffs and uh, re renewable energy subsidies and uh, genetically modified organisms and stuff like that. The point is, Sustainable development isn't inside that box. It's over here. And once you manage to get outside the box, then it's actually quite simple to understand what we have to do. Outside the box is cultural and psychological and social changes, mainly. Once we make them, 
some of the things inside the box will be useful to us. But if we ignore the social and the cultural and the, economic and the uh, political changes we have to make, it doesn't make any difference what we do inside the box because it isn't going to give us sustainable development. And because we have continued to look inside the box for the last 40 years, now we're really in for it. We're coming into a period of increasing problems and chaos. That's not a reason for despair, but it means you do need to change somewhat your habits. And so I think we need a new definition of sustainable development, and I present it here. Notice this is just a small change on the Brundtland definition. It's development that prepares the present system to deal with shocks and chaos in ways that will minimally compromise the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. I'm not talking about complete satisfaction here. I'm talking about survival, equity, peace. How do we do that? Well, it means we need to increase the resilience of the system. What does that mean? Resilience is the ability to continue providing essential functions even after receiving a shock. You know, and so examples are food or transport or health care, warmth. Certainly Iceland had an object lesson in resilience after the 2008 shock. Uh, resilience exists at the level of the individual. You can talk about how resilient somebody is after they lose their job or after they lose their partner. Resilience is at the level of the institution. How resilient is the university if its budget is cut? You can talk about the country. What happens if suddenly your currency isn't honored anymore in other areas? Um, so the resilience is a scalable concept. You can get into a useful, constructive conversation about it at any level. And typically when you do that, you start to think about things which are also good for sustainability. So it's not a substitute, it's an entree point. How do you measure? Uh, efficiency, on the other hand, is really just a ratio. It's a ratio of the things you want divided by the things you have to pay for. Uh, so efficiency can be uh, miles, uh, kilometers per liter, or uh, productivity of the labor force, or how much food do you get for a kilo of food, whatever. Wherever there's a ratio, uh, it gives you the possibility to calculate the efficiency. And generally, we think better efficiency is, is desirable. And that's true to a certain point. But unfortunately, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, Past a certain point, it's not true. This is a kind of conceptual scheme. Take the system that's interesting to you. If it's your person or your institution or your family uh, or uh, your country or your globe, draw an imaginary boundary around it and then list all the crucial things that have to come in and all the crucial things that have to go out for that thing inside the boundary to function well, to give life and peace and justice or whatever uh, you want. Then start to imagine that some of those flows are interrupted, either on coming in or going out. Either you don't get any oil or, for example, they quit picking up your garbage, whatever. How long can you last an interruption before you start to suffer? Of course, it varies. If I interrupt your oxygen supply, within seconds you start to have problems. If we interrupt the fuel supply for Iceland, it takes about 30 or 40 days because of the tanks you have before you start to have problems. If the trucks quit bringing food into Reykjavik, I don't know the precise numbers, but in my city, uh, three or four days is what you start to have problems. So these are the different indicators of resilience. The problem for us is that the pursuit of efficiency often lowers resilience. 
In the early stages, as you think make things more efficient, you actually are increasing its resilience. But out here, in this region, those things you do to increase the efficiency make the system actually less resilient. You know, the Japanese car manufacturers learned this uh, very effectively with the Fukushima disaster. Japan car manufacturers were known for being super efficient. They could produce their cars at a high quality cheaper than Americans or Europeans in the early days. But the way, one of the ways they did that was to concentrate all their manufacturing in particular factories. So there was literally one factory in Fukushima which produced one part very efficiently used in all of the Japanese cars. And when the Fukushima blew up, that factory was destroyed and suddenly the Japanese couldn't manufacture cars anymore. And at the same time, the computer manufacturers had a lesson because the floods in Bangkok destroyed the world's most efficient hard drive manufacturer. And when that factory quit functioning, suddenly computer makers around the world had difficulty manufacturing their computers. So now in Japan, at the, in the corporate leadership, they start to talk about not only efficiency, but resilience. How to give up a little efficiency in order to have a more resilient system. For sure you don't let one little factory someplace manufacture all the parts you need. You at least should put it into two places, etc. And you can carry out the same thing at the level of the individual, etc. Now, when you do this, it's useful to differentiate between two different kinds of problems. Universal and global. Universal problems affect everybody, uh, like uh, soil erosion or air pollution, but they can be solved locally. And when you pay something locally, you soon get the benefits from that. Global problems affect everybody, uh, like climate change, uh, but you can't solve it locally. And if you work to the solution and you're lucky, you pay here and now, and the benefits come over there later. Psychologically interesting, but not politically rewarding. Most political leaders are not willing to stand up and ask you to pay here and now so that somebody over there later will benefit from that. So when we start to think about resilience and those Focus initially on the universal problems. They're easier to solve, they give you quicker feedback. It doesn't mean the global problems are not important, but we need to build up our muscle first and we should start with the universal problems. How do we do that? Well, uh, first of all, quit looking for simple solutions. You know, there's what I call the mentality of the magic button. Everybody wants to know where is that button they can push which will solve all of these problems. It doesn't exist. Here's just one example. Uh, this is uh, from climate change. Uh, CO2 emissions can be understood to be the number of people times the amount of capital per person times the amount of energy required by that capital. So there's how many cars times how many gallons of or liters of petrol, etc. are used, or how many light bulbs times how many kilowatt hours are required to operate the light bulbs, uh, and then times the fraction of that energy which comes from fossil fuels. This is a little simplistic because even non-fossil fuel sources give you CO2, but on a global basis is not a bad uh, thing. The point is, we have been focusing over here. We've been looking at the technical factors. We've been pushing renewables, and we've been trying to increase the efficiency of our capital stock, insulating our houses and switching our light bulbs and, and so forth. But as long as there is exponential growth over here, it doesn't matter what you do over here, CO2 is still going to go up, which is in fact why it's still going up, because we ignore these things. We're looking for the simple fix and it doesn't exist. We need to look further ahead in time. Uh, unfortunately, we have built up our political and our economic systems on the basis of easy problems. Uh, here's a crude illustration. So this is now and that's the future. 
We're here now, and we want to be up there later. Up is better in this case. And unfortunately, this is the next evaluation. This is when you stand for tenure, or when you have to take an exam, or when you, next time you look at your bank account, or the next time you stand on the scale to see how heavy you weigh, whatever. The next time you get some feedback about your action. With easy problems, the things which actually take you where you want to go also make it look better in the short term. It's quite simple to adopt those habits. And in fact, our current political and economic system have done quite a good job. By and large, we don't have to worry about simple problems. The existing institutions are doing a relatively good job. Unfortunately, climate change, the depletion of oil, soil erosion, species loss, overfishing, these are not simple problems. They're difficult problems. And it means that the things which actually solve the problem over the long term make it look worse before the next evaluation, the next election, for example. Now, if you give a politician the choice here between action one and action two, and this is the next election, which one will they pick? And you see the problem. In order for us to be really adaptive, we need to take this out far enough that you start to see a an appropriate difference between the right actions and the wrong actions. So what does this mean for us? What, you know, personal strategies. Well, of course, I'm still trying to solve these problems for myself, so I don't imagine that my list is useful to you, but I'll tell you what I think about. First of all, I think it's important to remember that everyone, including me, make mistakes. And so just because someone tells you there's big problems coming doesn't necessarily mean there is big problems coming. Maybe they're wrong. So you should leave at least some possibility that they're making a mistake. Of course, also the people who tell you everything is going to be all right, they're making mistakes too. Except that you can't solve the whole problem. You know, I've many former students who come to me they say they're so discouraged they've been working on climate change and they don't see any progress and I say listen this is not your obligation to solve the whole problem just concentrate on doing your share uh, the way I say it is what you do you don't need to solve the whole problem but with your life you need to live it in such a way that if everybody else lived in that way it would solve the problem that's an ethical satisfaction of your responsibility as a human on this planet is to do your share. If that still doesn't give you a lot of satisfaction, reduce your boundaries. I spent 40 years working on global problems. I didn't see much progress. So now I'm building community gardens in, uh, around my town. And there I am seeing enormous progress. Uh, you know, people are wildly enthusiastic about it. So just keep bringing your boundaries down to the point where you start to get some kind of positive uh, reinforcement. Also very important, uh, I don't know you personally, but probably you're like my students and some of my colleagues. Uh, you're concerned about these problems. You're going to work hard on them. You're going to burn out. At some point, you just can't take it anymore. And to avoid that, you need to create some personal space. I uh, remember I had a friend, a uh, young woman, who actually came to me in tears one time. And she said, I said, you know, what's the problem? And she said, I, I don't have any time for my family. I don't have any, you know, my children are growing up. I don't see them because I'm just working all my time on these problems. And I said, you know, give me your calendar. So she brought out her book, and I took a pen, and I just put an X one day every week. And I said, on that day, that's for you and your family. And it doesn't matter if somebody wants you to attend some global conference or to do something. That's private space. You just have to create these boundaries. Private space has to be first, not just what's left over. Because if you wait for it to be what's left over, then nothing is left over. So create personal space. Uh, design resilience onto your own lifestyle. 
As a system analyst, I can tell you that when you have a complex system, even though most of it is behaving in a very brittle, brittle is the opposite of resilient, is behaving in a very brittle way, if you have nodes of resilience, it tends to stabilize the whole system. And so that's one of your contributions, is to create a lifestyle for yourself which can absorb these shocks and continue, which means that when the shocks come, which absolutely they will, your resources and your intellect will still be available outside your own personal survival to work on other issues. And value your friends. This isn't just a sort of emotional uh, final point. It's really based in scientific evidence. Uh, you know, uh, for example, we've done empirical studies which show that, uh, at least in my culture, at the age of 65, if and if you are a heavy smoker, for example, if you, it's better to get four or five new friends than to give up smoking. Now, of course, <laughs> best of all is to give up the friends, or get the friends and give up smoking. That's even better. But the friendships have an enormous physical impact on your well-being and your, even your lifestyle. Okay. At the organizational level, well, I'll, I was a professor for 40 years. I'll make a few self-centered sort of pr proclamations about the University of Iceland. I, uh, I know you won't pay attention and that's fine, but I feel compelled to do it, so here it is. Uh, remember that most of what we teach these days is wrong. And a lot of the rest of it is going to become obsolete very fast. Uh, I, so what does that mean? Well, it means that you should uh, not be focusing on giving people information, but rather teaching them skills, how to acquire information for themselves. And in this way, I find interaction with real problems to be enormously important. Not because it teaches the correct solution, but it teaches how to find a solution. That means teaching about paradigms. Uh, we sometimes imagine that this thing we carry in our head is reality. It isn't. It's just a, an image. It's a box or a set of boxes. And in order for us to serve our students well, we need to give them a mastery over their own paradigms so that they can use them when they're appropriate and switch them when they're not. And not get angry if other people speak from a different paradigm. We need to focus on ethics. Sustainability is not a destination, it's how you make the trip. How do you behave day by day under different circumstances? And that instantly brings you into the question of ethics. I used to teach a course in my graduate program for professionals, and ethics was one of the most important segments uh, of the course. I didn't imagine that I knew what my students' ethics should be, but I understood that they needed to know what they were, and I gave them opportunities to sort them out. Help people to understand that they're responsible for more things than just their narrow discipline. Remember I defined efficiency as a ratio between what you want and what you have to pay for. One of our big problems is that we permit people to pay for a little piece of it and push everything else out, make everything else into externalities. So they think that they're making things more efficiently, but from a bigger perspective, we understand they're causing a, a disaster. Get people to start automatically bringing those other factors into the denominator. Teach about resilience. The nice thing about resilience is it actually means something. Sustainability doesn't. People do not actually understand what sustainable means because it's been used in so many different ways now that it has no meaning anymore. Resilience has a very specific meaning, at least in applied to a particular system, and leads you into concrete discussion about different kinds of activities. And, and this is also important. Remember that actually one of the most important effects of the university is that it gives people an opportunity to form lifelong professional friendships. There's been many studies which show, for example, Harvard Business School, which is often ranked as one of the top business schools, is good not because of what it teaches, but because of who you meet there. 
And those people last uh, for the rest of your career. What you learn in a business school doesn't actually last very long. So just keep that in mind. And then I'll finish up with one more quick uh, exercise, which is actually the most important thing I've said this afternoon. And I, if you don't remember anything else, uh, try to remember this. So I'm going to ask all of you to clap your hands just once at the same moment. Don't do it yet. And let me say, this is not a sneaky way to get applause for my speech. Uh, I'm just explaining it. Don't do it. I'm going to count to three slowly. One, two, three. Then I'll say clap. Precisely at that moment when I say clap, everybody claps their hands. And if we're successful, outside there will be just one big noise. Okay, here we go. One, two, three, clap. <laughs> this shows a very important point. Your actions are much more important than your words. I told you to do one thing, you understood it, you wanted to do it. I did something different, and most of you paid attention to that. It's the same way with these issues of sustainability and resilience. If you go out of here talking about these, but your behavior is by the same old habits, which are unsustainable and brittle, nobody will be fooled. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Meadows. No wonder you, you shipped all over the globe to speak and entertain and scare the life out of your audience. Of course, we're all very frightened now. Um, I, we have a few minutes for questions. Anything that comes to your mind. So, let me just say, I know that some of you have other obligations, so please feel free to stand up and walk out, and I won't take it personally. <laughs> well, I will. Okay. <laughs> so. We'll, we'll bring a microphone to you. Please stand up and introduce yourselves. So. Hi, um, thank you for your speech. Um, my name is Sarah, and I'm a PhD student in uh, environmental sociology here at the university. And um, my question concerns the emphasis on population growth with concern to environment problems. Because they certainly form, you know, a part of your argument and so on. And um, so my question is that to what extent is an emphasis on population growth justifiable considering the huge disparities in resource consumptions between those populations that have already stabilized and those who are still growing the poor. So that's one question. If I so, may so add just, just stick with one. Yeah. What is, so. So um, to what extent is an emphasis on population relative, an to, emphasis, yeah, yeah. relative to economic growth okay. when talking about these problems? I hope you, yeah. So, I already told you not to expect simple solutions, therefore you shouldn't expect simple answers either. I'm going to say a few things which I hope you will consider to be relevant to your question, but of course it won't answer your question because I don't know the full answer. When we start to think about any of these issues, it's important to realize that we cannot know ahead of time the policy or the solution which is going to solve the problem, avoid mistakes, and make everybody happy. Uh, 
if you hold, if you wait for that, you're paralyzed. Then you aren't able to take any action. So my friend and colleague Herman Daly has this idea. The way you make a long journey is you take a few steps and see where you are, look around, and then you take a few more steps. And in this way, finally, you can make a long journey without knowing at the beginning exactly where you're going to go. I have the same impression about population. The first thing we need to do in the poor countries, where there's rapid rates, is simply create the circumstances for people to have the number of children they want. That's already a step in the right direction. Because for a variety of reasons, poor education of women, inadequate health services, high you know, all of these uh, different reasons, people have more kids than they really want. And so if we could create the, the possibility that they have just as many as they want, that already starts to stabilize things. That's in the poor countries. In the rich countries, like Iceland, like the United States, the European Union, there I think the priority is to rethink our policies about population growth. We have a set of expectations about economic growth, about support of the elders, uh, which come out of a period of rapid uh, demographic expansion. Now the rich countries, Japan is leading, even China actually, for other reasons, will come into this uh, period, Germany. The population stabilizes, and that means the labor force starts to go down. The ratio of old people to young people starts to go up, so the dependency ratios work, so the social welfare systems start to go bankrupt in the traditional way, and so forth. So we have to rethink that. Uh, Recently, I was reading an analysis of Japan's economic future, and they pointed out that the labor force is going down, and this person, this analyst, said, catastrophe. Well, it's not a catastrophe. It's actually a triumph. We, we want the global population to go down, but we need to let it go down in a way which supports the old people and uh, distributes the economy output equity and so forth. So we need to think that through. There's absolutely no thought whatsoever these days in the rich countries about how to cope in a constructive way with a stable and declining population and labor force. So in the poor countries facilitate a fertility according to their standards. In the rich countries, start thinking through the implications of declining fertility so that we can get out of this stupid response of subsidizing women to have more babies or opening up the immigration uh, requirements so that more young, poor workers will come in to run our factories. Uh, now, neither of those will solve the problem, of course. I don't think there is a solution for the problem in the way you define it. We've been on this planet for 200,000 years in something like our current form. There have always been richer people and poorer people. I mean, that's from the beginning of Iceland's history. It was like that here. It certainly was like that in the state. So uh, the simplistic ideas about, well, we can't do something because there are a lot of poor people need to be made more complex and sophisticated and more in touch with the realities of, of what we face. Uh, I put up the CO2 equation and I showed it from two things, population and living standard. I'd be quite happy if we could start worrying about our living standard issues and let the poorer countries start worrying about their population issues. I don't, I'm not trying to solve global problems by imposing my standards you know, on the poorer countries. Later, once we're some decades into this, you know, then we will see where we are and figure out what to do next. But at least at the start, I think that gives you a basis. I'll try to be more brief. I apologize. For it. It's a problem with being a professor for 40 years, you know. You put you up on a podium and your habit is to just start talking. That's fine. Uh, my name is Hathkrim Rekeson. I'm a bachelor student in mathematics. I was wondering whether you had any suggestions on uh, how to improve our current political systems to increase the odds of our leaders adopting sustainable adaptation loops for solving problems. How to do what? 
I'm sorry. Uh, how to change? Let me say, your English is good. My hearing is bad, so I'm. I'm You're I'm, very kind. Uh, I was wondering if you had any suggestions on how to improve our current political systems oh. to increase the probabilities. That yes, I do. That our leaders could solve these problems in yes, the future. Yes, I do. An example would be maybe increasing terms of service. Yeah, I have lots of suggestions. Go. Carry on, Next please. question. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> I, I, here again, I'm going to do what I did uh, for the first person. I'll say some things, uh, and, and you won't imagine somehow I have eliminated the, uh, the problem. Now, I hesitate to say this in Iceland, which has made democracy work for it quite well for a thousand years. Uh, I mean, relatively well, compared with some places like... Let's not go into Okay. Uh, but we have to understand democracy at least this idealized version of it that we have in our mind, is a very recent and I think a very temporary form of governance. Uh, when I'm on the continent, let's say in Germany, there I have you know richer history to draw in. On uh, in Germany, for example, you know they were an imperial state uh, for centuries, and then they briefly uh, had a democracy didn't work very well, then they had a dictatorship, that certainly didn't work very well, now they have another democracy, and they somehow imagine this is it, you know, now we're finished with that. No, a democracy, you know, is in itself highly variegated. The democracy which exists here is enormously different from the democracy which exists in the United States or Japan or etc. And it's changing. So, don't make a box for yourself when you start talking about governance. Don't sort of say, you know, don't, what's the solution? Maybe we should elect people for three or four years longer than we do now. Or maybe we should create a new bureaucratic office. You're thinking inside the box. Pull back and, and think bigger. I'm going to do that just to illustrate. I'm not saying what I, what I say is not necessarily true, but it illustrates doing that. Uh, for me, the essential one of the essential problems we face today globally is not that it's democracy or it's dictatorship or something else, it's the scale. If I would presume to understand something about Iceland's history, an enormous strength of your country has been that it's relatively homogeneous and that you have some basis and some reason to care about other people. There's no governmental system which will prevent people who don't like each other from taking advantage of each other and doing bad things. And I think on the other hand, there's probably no governmental form so awful that if people generally respect each other and like each other and care, then they will manage somehow, irrespective of their governance, you know, to move along. So, when I think about governance, I don't think about you know, changing the election cycle or something like that. I start to think about how you give people an identity with their country, a sense of responsibility and caring for their neighbors, uh, uh, a concern for indicators of progress other than employment and income GP and uh, how many horsepower in your car and stuff like that, but a more qualitative understanding. That's where we need to work. And if we start to become more effective at that, I think the governance system will take care of itself. I mean, governance is a tool. It's not a solution. And we need to create the circumstances that we start to look for the right solution. And when we know what the solution is, then we'll find a tool. And that's, that's where governance will come in. Uh, there's a plot, which is, I suppose, put out by my State Department, which shows the number of democracies in the world, you know, and it goes up and then we think, oh, that's, uh, uh, th this is just silly. I mean, it, it, it totally misunderstands uh, the situation. And so, w 
one of the treasures, you know, for Iceland is you have a relatively small scale. Now, we can't, the whole world can't be divided up into countries with 310,000 people in it, but uh, that's what you've got. So, I mean, that, that's a good basis for governance. Okay. Hello, thank you for a very inspiring lecture. My name is Petri Nauskistotir, and I want to ask you about your view on how feasible is the implementation of sustainable development, given the political emphasis worldwide on economic growth, which is often at the expense on, uh, on the environment and on the quality of people's lives. Can you summarize the question for me? Yeah, it's about how feasible is the implementation of sustainable development, given the emphasis. How feasible is the, the implementation of, of sustain sustainable development? Given the emphasis on economic growth. Okay. okay. I, I told you bef in my speech. I think the, t the phrase sustainable development is nonsense. It's, it, it, um, it's like a phrase peaceful war. I mean, it, it has no meaning. And so, so your, I interpret your, your question, you know, what evidence do I see of something which actually is a fantasy? I don't see evidence of it. You know, I mean, people pick up some litter now and recycle their bottles and cans and uh, start to think about composting their ways. I mean, so there's some things which are consistent with our notions of sustainable development. But overall, there has really been no change at all. And you look at the current crisis, which is gripping the whole world at the moment, the economic crisis. The response is, more growth, how to get growth, how to stimulate growth. Uh, the printing of money in the United States now is a desperate effort to rekindle growth. This is not, this doesn't, is not evidence of any interest in or any competence about sustainable development. Um, I think there's been a little progress in some ways in awareness but you know, problems are not caused by awareness. Problems are caused by action. And the actions don't seem to be changing. Now, that's why I have abandoned the idea of sustainability, because I'm not able to create positive, optimistic ideas about it for myself and switch over to resilience. In the field of resilience, I start to see now some progress in the early stages. And actually, if you do a search on the web under resilience and under sustainability, uh, resilience is coming up and sustainability is going down in, in Google. Yeah. Um, the gentleman with the piece of paper. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Johannes Bjarmarsson. I'm uh, with uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, Eaton projects in Iceland. Oh, or he could speak in Icelandic and then you could transfer. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. okay. I'm, I speak, uh, I'm from the Eaton project, uh, what we are called the Eaton Gardens in Iceland. Yeah. And we have been uh, uh, working on uh, uh, what you call soil sustainability. There is one thing that uh, I have found out that uh, is never inside the um, calculations of sustainability in the world is hemp. Uh, hemp can, you know, can provide us with energy or really about 90% of everything that we use today. Why is that? You know, that's never calculated into the uh, uh, in, into this. Okay, hemp, H-E-M-P. Yes. You can, you know, ninety percent of everything that you use today—food, medicine, energy, 
building materials, whatever, is wow. made from this one plant, and, but it's never calculated yeah. into this thing, and it takes up about four, uh, uh, a, four times uh, more CO2 also. A, a rule which I find is very useful is that people and institutions tend to measure things which are easy to measure rather than things which are important. Uh, and it's self-reinforcing because when you start to measure something then you think it's important and you quit paying attention to those things you don't have any information on even even though actually they're... and I, I think this issue lies into that category. It's, it's hard and so therefore it just doesn't show up in the measures. One more question at the back and then one here at the front and then we will have to start. Thank you minutes. very much. Uh, thank you very much for an excellent speech. I'm sure we were all greatly inspired. I was just wondering, uh, sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Anne Maria Spar. I work as an environmental consultant. Um, you encouraged us to develop strategies for uh, increasing our personal resilience. Can you take some practical examples of what we could perhaps do here in Iceland? Or if it's difficult for you to think about Iceland, what, what an, a typical American would do, for example? I, they don't listen to me in the United States. <laughs> so I know they won't listen to me over here either, which gives me a certain freedom, you see, to say something. Personal resilience, so I, I will mention at two very different levels. I, I said that resilience, one advantage of resilience is that you can deal with this concept at any level, personal or, or, or national. So at the personal level, I'll tell you, uh, so I, I'm not familiar with sort of the living standards, even inside Reykjavik, and I haven't been outside yet, so, but I'll, I'll, I'll just get do what I showed you. Draw, take your household. So the people, your family, living in some household. Draw the conceptual circle around it and think what has to come in and what has to go out. What has to come in? Electricity, heat, food, income, friends coming in, I suppose, etc. And what has to go out. Then play the mental game. What happens if suddenly one morning no electricity or no heat or no food is coming in? What would that mean for you concretely? And how, what could you do to reduce the problem? So I'll, I will, um, I'll tell you some, so what I did just to illustrate. Um, <clears throat> These are stupid ideas, but, and they don't solve the problem, but I just to illustrate. So, uh, in my place where I live, actually interruption of electricity is an important problem. My house, at my house, the electricity goes off a couple times a year. And sometimes for a long time. I, uh, my neighbor actually had, you know, like, uh, or people I know, not, had you know, sometimes two weeks with no electricity. Uh, why? Well, we have trees in the United States, and the trees fall over on the wires, and you know, etc. So, what to do? Uh, so, first of all, you uh, build a lot of windows so that you know you don't need only electric lights. Uh, and then uh, I built a backup generator. Uh, so I have now a machine which comes on automatically if the electricity goes off. Uh, insulate the house so that if the energy quits coming in, it takes a longer time before it goes back out. And flashlights. I mean, you know, these are trivial things, but this illustrates. Or food. Uh, so uh, we... Uh, built uh, in our basement a room where we can put a lot of food. Uh, actually, in my country, just to show you how far things are going, you can now, on the internet, buy a box, and this box has about a month of food in it. And it's treated in such a way that it will last for 20 years. So you buy the box, you put it in a room, and you just don't have to think about it for 20 years. And you just know that if 
things happen, you can go down there and open up the box and see what. It, it will be horrible stuff, you know. But better than nothing. So I mean, this is at the personal level, and and, and uh, don't you know? Don't get into debt. Uh, so always pay your bills. So and and and. and. At the national level, you know, take Iceland for example. Where are the crucial vulnerabilities? Food. You have become dangerously dependent on food imports. So what does that mean? It doesn't only mean, so stockpiling. Uh, maybe changing consumption habits. You know, if you can, don't have to eat so much meat, but can eat vegetables, then a certain amount of food lasts a lot longer. You're further down the food chain. Uh, gardens, or the capacity for gardens, or the knowledge for gardens. I mean, it's worthwhile to teach people how to grow gardens, even if they don't want to grow gardens, just so that when they need to, they could. Uh, and then, and so energy, an absolutely essential issue facing Iceland is what you're going to do with those oil deposits, which may be under the sea north of the country. We don't know if they're there for sure, probably, hopefully they are. They are significant for Iceland. They are totally insignificant for the world. The world could use up your oil in about two days and never even notice. Uh, but for you, it could sustain your transport fleet for years. So it's a question, how, what are the criteria that you use for thinking about the development uh, of those oil uh, resources? Uh, beyond that, I don't know. You, you have such a, a unique energy system here. I'm not very, uh, I don't understand it very well. I mean, it's a, as you know, totally unique in the world. So, uh, but, uh, but energy is, is crucial. You have plenty of water, it seems. Uh, and so I don't know what are the other crucial vulnerabilities, but uh, food is one that which would keep you occupied for quite a long time to figure out about that one. It's, oh, this one. The thing to know is that resilience isn't an absolute endpoint. You don't get to being resilient. You can be more resilient or less resilient. And so what we're just simply trying to do is become a little more resilient, not to insulate ourselves totally from the global problems, which is impossible. Resiliency, that's me. Uh, Dr. Meadows, uh, I have a very short question. Yeah. I took my examination as a professional translator in this exact hall uh, uh, several years ago. An important, very important question per, will perhaps elicit only a short answer. I have read somewhere or, le uh, or seen on television, world population is expected perhaps to go up to 20 billion about 2050. Is there any possibility we can do anything about it? Or should we try? There's virtually no chance whatsoever global population would go to 20 billion over that time period. Uh, the UN projections, which I think are unrealistically high, take it up to about 9 billion. That is too much. There's no possibility to sustain 9 billion people on this planet under attractive circumstances. Uh, should we try to do something about it? Yes, absolutely. Uh, what? Well, that's a question which doesn't permit simple general answers. You really need to look at the particular circumstances to, to start to think out. But it is absolutely a problem. A, a friend of mine says, you know, if we don't solve population growth problems, it's impossible to solve any of the other problems. So we absolutely need to do it. Well, I think at that note, we'll call it a day. Thank you yep. so much, Dr. Matos, for the contribution.